quiet seaside town, an evil lain to rest centuries ago, has risen. An abandoned fortress deep in the swamp holds a secret that could save the village or destroy it. Now, a band of adventurers sets out to dig up the wounds of the past and bring the light of day to the roots of ruin. This is Tabletop Gold. friends and welcome to another edition of tabletop gold the podcast that dares ask what if some people played a role-playing game my name is lars castine i'm your host i'm your game master for this podcast this evening we're gonna say hello to everybody else who's in the cast because that's just what we do it's like bill paxton in the film twister and he says that's what we do. We chase storms. David the Tin Man Chernikov is here. Yes, present. Good that time. Good that time. Robin Lang is also here. Good that time, and I'm still alive. Yeah, still alive. Woo! Still still kicking. Uh, still co- COVID negative. Well, no, I mean not oh, really. Oh There's gosh. Still okay. The, the, Let's... The, the faintest line, but. <laughs> well, that's a can of worms I just opened up, isn't it? Uh... <laughs> COVID mediocre. COVID. <laughs> COVID ish. A sousson. COVID curious <laughs> Robin Lang. <laughs> um, Armat Humphreys is here. Good evening. Good that time and also with you. And with you as well. And Zoe Chernikoff is also here. Hello. Hello. There's one thing I want to do before we get into the rest of the show. Uh, you may know that every episode, Armat Humphreys needs to place a frozen lasagna on top of his computer in order for it to not uh, catch fire and melt during the course of our recording. I want to let you know, listener, that the day of the lasagna is over because Armat has a new computer. Woo! R.I.P. Lasagna. Woo! Woo! Wait, can I ask a question? Was it on top or underneath? Uh, it was underneath. It, it oh, was I'm definitely, sorry. yeah. No, it, it's I cool. really yeah. like the idea that at this point, the reveal is you were actually putting, like, taking it out of the box on top of your keyboard and just kind of mashing about. <laughs> uh, I I was slowly snacking on it every <laughs> just, right. episode, just As it getting warmed. a little bit more veggie frozen, H E B veggie frozen <laughs> lasagna. Um, that explains the escalating tech issues. Yeah, as, yes. the, as the mass of lasagna, lasagna remained, decreased, the, it melted into the computer. <laughs> it grew progressively more and more. Uh, yeah. In my mind, the moment you plugged in this new computer, your old computer caught fire. Like in my moment, it was like you were jumping away from the leading edge of a fireball and just barely managed to get a new computer plugged in. I will say, I did not look back at the explosion. Uh, just so yeah, the no, listener no. can picture it, I uh, striding in slow motion. It was uh, epic as hell. Yeah, it's so lovely. Like we can see you more clearly with this new computer. Like everything about it is just next level. Like you're living in the year three thousand. I I have to admit, like I was initially sort of bah muggy about it. Like, no oh, new computer, who needs it? I'm old. I don't <laughs> need. And now I'm like, oh my god, it works! I can like access a program, and, and it doesn't take me half an hour for it to boot. <laughs> I'm so I'm so excited for all of us. It's amazing. what were you writing? Um, so you just because you just finished your uh, master's in creative writing. I did. What yeah. uh, what program were, were you just writing that in Word? Yeah, Word must have been a bitch on that computer. Just trying like in a document probably that size. It, uh, well, the trick was I discovered actually I separated each chapter out into its own Word doc. <laughs> That's the only way you got it to work properly. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Because <laughs> no. I remember doing my dissert like doing dissertations when I was doing my masters, 
and trying to run any sort of decent sized word program, like word document, especially when I was doing ones with like EndNote and like footnoting documents. Oh God. It was like opening them. Would I would have to sit there, click the open it and then walk away for 10 minutes to go like make a cup of tea and some toast and then come back and hope that it had fully opened. Okay. Related word story. A friend in college, and this is a friend that most, most of you on this call know, but whom I will not out, went through at least two years of college, and I think the entirety four years of college, on a trial version of Microsoft Office, <laughs> the conditions of which were <laughs> that you could only open it 10 times before the trial version was elapsed and you can no longer get into it (laughs) so this person never shut down their computer so you get 2.5 times a year of college in order to keep microsoft (laughs) word open all the time in order to not have to pay for microsoft (sighs) word and it caused this person's computer to run so slowly and insanely that for the final year of college i kept trying to buy this person microsoft office (laughs) just so i would not have to witness or, or even just know that this was happening. And this is at a point in my life where I don't, I don't know what Microsoft Office cost. I did have a ton of money kicking around. Would have been entirely, entirely worth it to me. But it was it, it got to that point. It was just complete, complete um, sludgy tech cruft. I am pretty sure that the place that we went to college gave you either a free or no joke, like a $10 <laughs> copy of Microsoft Word. Like you could buy an, inc- I can't remember if it was free like on or a student like, rate or yeah, whatever. when we were in yeah, college, totally. like we were in college in the early 2000s and there were, they were throwing Microsoft Word. Um, Imagine us. doing that for $10, <laughs> four years. <laughs> That kind of decision making drives me completely <laughs> around the bend. The idea of tolerating some long term, frustrating, incapacitating issue just because you don't know how to make a thing happen. Well, you, sir, would struggle with my parents. <laughs> Also, it's fine. You just put a lasagna under it. It's going to be fine. (laughs) Fine. (laughs) Just don't think too hard about it ever. It's like human adaptability. That's what uh, enables us to just gradually accept these increasingly sort of attenuated and crippling conditions because we're built to just like accept (laughs) gradual things and like make it work. But it can absolutely be turned against itself. And suddenly you're, you know. Whatever you you won't shut down your computer or your 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 computer's on a on a lasagna or in the case of my parents you you won't pay for for reasonable things because you what what if you didn't pay for them you know you'd have more money is this why before every recording session you send out a lovely little reminder to all of us to shut down our computers for ten minutes. <laughs> Right. Is this is this past trauma sort of reasserting itself in this like very generous, gentle way? Let's just say I have trouble personally, like (laughs) with um, suffering through avoidable challenges. <laughs> Other people's avoidable challenges. Whether they're avoidable by me or by it's just like, well, we could do a thing and not have this, but we're just gonna we're just gonna not do the thing and have it. Like, come on. Th- that sends me into the into the state of mind, Lars, that you were describing a moment ago, where it sends me completely around the bend. That's just a an easily pushed button. Well, uh, I appreciate that conversation. I'm certainly going to restart my computer uh, constantly now, uh, having learned uh, the the positive benefits thereof. Uh, Before we get into our game, I want to take a moment to thank everyone who has left a review of Tabletop Gold at their podcast app of choice. Like, for instance, on Podcast Addict, Jim... left uh, left a review saying, this podcast has quickly become one of my favorites. Uh, the sound is crisp, the mic technique is stellar, and it's funny as all get up. Isn't that great? Isn't that nice? Thank you, Jim, for leaving that review. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you, we Jim. We agree, Jim. We agree. Appreciate you. <laughs> yes, we agree. The mic technique, uh, I'll, I'll give it a B minus, but I'm the person who mixes the show. Uh, everybody else, though, I think <laughs> loves it. So well, you make us great. sound great, Lars. Yeah. Oh, thanks. 
I know I have a bad habit of bobbing and weaving around the mic. Uh, no, you're fine. You're fine. Everything's great. Uh, with that, everybody, <laughs> let's get into our game. Your trip home from the Dungeons Below Gauntlet has taken an unexpected turn. After being enlisted by a man named Philrook to help him recover his mushroom picking bag, you found yourself shepherded into a rocky valley where hundreds of living stones awakened and pummeled you mercilessly. Now, before you've had a chance to treat your wounds, it has become clear that you are the targets of a meticulously crafted ambush. After tossing Philrick's treasured bag into the air, two kobolds wearing odd jelly-like helmets have leapt from the valley's edge and are rushing your companion with their spears. And as this chaotic moment has broken out, it is time for all of us to please roll for initiative. Roll for initiative. All right, so let's get your rolls. David, what did you roll for Mag? It's a... Man, I rolled a two, so it's a nine for Mag. I don't think she was expecting something quite this hot on the heels of the uh, the gravel swarms of yesterday. Nobody expects the jellyfish-headed kobold... Oh, sorry. <laughs> How do you think Mag is, like... Do you think part of Mag's being a little slow off the marks, like, ha has anything to do with the fact that Norman has been talking about how, like, these kobolds are friendly and so on, and, and suddenly they're behaving in this, like, very strange way that doesn't map on to what you're expecting? Is that part of it, do you think? Yeah, I think Mag is also a little shook from the rest of the morning. She did not have a very, uh, a very wise or a very Mag morning sort of charging after stuff and getting herself and the party knocked out and paralyzed and stuff. So I think she's just having a little bit of a sloppy day. Makes sense. Uh, Robin, what did you roll for Trill's initiative? Trill rolled a 20 on the die for a 30. Wow, fantastic. So Trill is, yeah. is super, super fast. So so this these kobolds jumped out right as Trill was asking for healing, basically, yeah. which got interrupted. Yeah, so Trill's... Trill's on edge and like she remember we walked in here into this kind of what feels like a hurting area and Trill's been on edge from the moment they got there feeling like she's being watched feeling like this is a danger zone and so I don't think Trill's let go of that and so and now especially that she knows she needs healing she's just feeling even more aware of her surroundings and so I guess that helped her feel ready to be attacked so she's ready to go. Armet, what did um what did you roll for initiative for Vadim? Uh Vadim got an eleven on the die for an eighteen. So I think his he's, you know, a little off guard from from the pebble swarm. Those things were weird. Uh definitely outside of his experience, but you know, sorta still nervous about what's going on here. And Zoe, what did you roll for Norman? Uh, Norman got a 21. I feel like he's he's not so much in this for the fight, but he's like, yeah, some friends. Like, we're finally gonna, I'm finally gonna show off these kobolds. We're all gonna hang out. We're gonna, you know, maybe we'll wrestle a little, but we'll, uh, we'll make it work. So, so do you think Norman at this moment suspects that anything is different about these kobolds than he imagined? So I feel like he's registering the funny helmets they're wearing, but to be clear, while he has said to everyone that these are, you know, creatures he knows intimately, he's never even really seen them at, at whatever the burned down llama is. Rusty llama? Broken llama? The thirsty alpaca. Thirsty oh, alpaca. Yeah, there, there we go. Is. That's what the, he meant. Um, a rusty llama but, is something totally different. You really shouldn't mention that in polite. Uh, yeah, I'm going to edit that out. Yikes. Um, Anyway, so, like, I, I think that, like, he's like, oh, funny helmets, but because he's sort of, like, convinced himself these are good friends of his, I think he doesn't really know 
whether they've been fucking wearing helmets before or not, right? Got so it. he's like, oh, helmets. Like, you know, he puts on, he could be in a pirate outfit for all we know. He's not, but, you know, just a fun hat. Got it. Just so you guys know, Philrick rolled a uh, bad initiative roll. He's bad at stuff. He's not good at doing anything. He rolled a seven on the die to get a 10. So he's going to be right in the middle of the pack. And let's get things started as these kobolds are silently and jerkily running towards Philrick with their spears out. Here's the situation. You are on this incline coming up out of these underground tunnels with steep walls on each side. The four of you are bunched together at the bottom of this hill. Philrick has run halfway up the hill and the two kobolds that are advancing upon Philrick with this with his mushroom picking bag sitting between them are near the top of this slope. We're going to start things off at the beginning of round one with Trill. So, Trill, how are you going to deal with this tense and dangerous situation? Well, Trill's going to do what Trill does best, and Trill's going to embolden the party! Woo! Da, da, da. With a little music. Oh, And so Trill's going to do her performance check for Lingering Composition. Oof, that's only a 14. So that's a failure. No focus point spent. So one round of Inspire Courage for everyone. And Trill's looking at these kobolds. She's remembering everything that Norman said. She noticed these, what they're wearing, that they look weird. They don't look like kobolds normally look. And so she's trying to figure out what's going on with their helmets, with their outfits, with what's happening with them. Got it. So give me a blind occultism check, please. Okay. That's a good fit for Trill. Would this be oddity identification? Would I get the boost Um, from that? I don't know. What does that do? Like, That's, what, what, I identify what is that? magic with specific traits as a circumstance bonus. It's not magic. It's a okay. person. Well, that's why. Or, I, no, that's... I mean, it's a helmet. Yeah. <laughs> if I don't, it's a plus two bonus. So I figure I may as well ask. I think it's great. I just don't know what it does. Let's get that blind occultism. Okay. So Trill gets a good look from even from this distance and has the sense that these are not helmets. This is actually a somewhat uncommon aquatic creature called an incutilis. Oh. And what Trill knows about incutiluses, incutilises. Incutilisi? Uh, could be. She probably knows the, the plural form. The incutiloda. She's heard of incutiluses from strange stories about entire ships full of sailors arriving to port with these odd helmets on them. And what these odd helmets are, are like essentially nautiluses, like like aquatic uh, arthropods or whatever that latch onto their victim's brain and start feeding on their thoughts and controlling them like a puppet. Ooh. Kobold puppets. The Trill realizes, Norman! Norman, you're right! There's there's something wrong! I know what those helmets are! Those aren't helmets at all! <gasps> we have to get those those sh- those brain-sucking shells off the kobolds' heads! They're brain barnacles? Oh, God. Yeah! That's <laughs> that's really good! Yeah, Vadim, that's exactly what they are! Brain barnacles! Um... So for her last action, she's going to, with a performance, probably with her guitar, with her lute, I assume that Norman's going to try and do something to attack one of those Nautiluses. She's going to try and create a distraction to help Norman. In my mind, that's just Trill chanting, Norman, 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 <laughs> Norman. <laughs> Next up on initiative, as Trill shouts out these words of support towards Norman, is one of these combatants that I'm going to have delay their turn. Uh, which means that it is now Weird. Norman's turn. So Norman looks at the combatant that is, I guess, to his left, uh, and he goes, Oh, hey, you brought some food for the picnic. We love shellfish. Because uh, he's like still continuing to misunderstand what's happening. <laughs> but 
bumbling along. He's like, well, the, the blanket's going to be over there. Uh, and so he inadvertently attempts to create a distraction behind this thing to see if, like, unwittingly trying to get it to turn around to see where the picnic will be. Uh, and that is a 18. And that means that it's an odd moment where first the helmet seems to turn to look where it is that you're directing, <laughs> and then the kobold turns to follow the helmet. It, it must be, you must be seeing things. It's just a little loose on the head. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. probably just mitflits again. Just mitflits. But yeah, they, they, they turn and, and they buy the distraction for, the, for this brief moment. And Norman goes, come join the party. Set it on down. Uh, and and hurls some rocks sort of in a jovial. I guess he's feeling like rocks are just flying around. And that's a 13 at the helmet with TKP. So that rock is flying around. It sails right over the head of this kobold and the helmet that it is wearing. Even with my, I would, even if my performance check wouldn't have helped that, would it? That's true. Sorry. And I should have gotten the aid from, from Trill ahead of time. That's okay, just set it down with your hands. The kobold turns around and looks at you with wide, dead eyes as it just slowly turns away from the distraction that you've set up for it. It is now Vadim's turn as Norman fires off this magical spell. Vadim is going to just book it past Norman. Scream, brand barnacles! Oh, God! <laughs> <laughs> This is this is definitely not a thing he is comfortable with. <laughs> um, so he is going to stride 25 feet past Phil Rook, positioning himself between the older gentleman and these creepy, creepy things. He's then going to stride again into range. Or I guess he'll step just in case kobolds have some sort of martial training. And then with vigilance, he will make a quick, non-lethal strike at the incutilis or uh, brain barnacle. <laughs> so that is a twenty-three to hit, and that hits. And you you feel vigilance slice oddly effortlessly through this strange helmet that you know is a brain barnacle. I can drop the act. <laughs> yeah, you you cut through this thing and cut a massive hole in it. Twelve damage. Nice. As you cut into it, maybe even reflexively, a tentacle bursts out of this helmet and slams towards Vadim in a swift kind of like uh, action. It's like the part in John Carpenter's The Thing where they're doing the uh, defibrillator and the chest opens up and bites the guy's hand off. Sorry, spoilers. Here we go. An attack on <laughs> Vadim from this tentacle that is 15 to hit. That is not going to do it. And that happens twice more. Just thwip, thwip. Three tentacles total fly out towards Vadim in rapid succession. Next up an 11. After that, a 10. So Vadim nimbly is able to sort of bob and weave out of the way of these. Ah! Oh, no, keep it away from me. Oh, that's horrifying. On Philric's turn, he shouts out, Oh, I don't care how nice my bag is. This this isn't worth it. And he starts running back into the tunnel to cower behind Mag. And it is at this moment that, that the kobold standing next to Vadim lurches forward and reaches out its spear to try to stab at Vadim in his shins. And that's a, an eight to hit. I think Vadim just like picks his knee up at, at the leg and is just like, ah! <laughs> and then a second eight to hit as another spear strike comes out and the kobold sort of mechanically walks backwards up the hill to put some distance between himself and his attacker. At this point, it is somebody else's turn, and they're going to delay their turn, which means that it is now Mag's turn. Mag, you have seen this strange lurching conflict at the top of this slope. You hear the birds chirping in the air. You are out of breath because you have just completed a rage, and you are no longer able to rage until you have had the chance to wait for 10 minutes. Phil Rook is panting behind you in fear. What will you do? Can I recall knowledge on the birds? What kind of birds are we working with? Oh, they're sparrows. Okay. Um, 
Well, so yeah, Mag, um, she would start by sort of, just by instinct, I think would start to kind of like summon rage and then of course realize that it's not coming because she's just, she's done that and she's and she's already feeling some amount of fatigue. And then I think trying to rage and not being able to rage would make her really mad, but she wouldn't be able to <laughs> rage still, you know? She'd be kind of stuck in this, oh my you God, know, Welcome sort to of, my work life. Yeah, it's like... <laughs> <laughs> you want to rage, but you just know that you can't. You just can't. So um, Max Flail is still out from the previous encounter, and there is one spot here where Mag could position herself where she would be able to hit both of these adversaries with a with a strike. So she as she executes her sudden charge up the hill to this one tactically advantageous spot, she calls behind her to Trill and says, "If I kill the barnacles, will the kobold survive?" What does Trill know? Yeah, I gave you very little information about these creatures. Trill knows that if these barnacles die, these kobolds will need immediate medical attention. I I think they'll be okay, but we're going to need to help them. Nothing a good meal can't fix. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a, a lot of mushrooms soon, says Mag as she arrives uh, at the spot between the kobolds. So she will also make a non-lethal strike with her flail against the same one that Vadim has already has already hit once Mag wants to do a non-lethal strike of the same one 20 to hit minus 2 for being non-lethal right so that's an 18 and that does hit Mag feels the end of her flail connect with this helmet all right and that is going to be 11 damage so this Incutilus goes slack and just sort of falls slowly off of the head of this of this kobold as you knock it fully unconscious. And at that moment, the kobold slumps to the ground. And just to give you guys insight into what's happening in mechanical terms, yeah, is now dying too. Oh, dang. I just want to say I really like the idea of a non-lethal flail. Like, just a little tap from the right. flail. Like, <laughs> yeah. boop, boop, right. boop. A special flick of the wrist at the end that just makes it go kind of like, boop, boop. Boop, boop. It a makes little sense that it would be difficult. <laughs> That's what I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> it makes sense that it would be harder to do than to not do. All right. So the sudden charge is two actions. So I've got one more action, and with that last action, I would like to sweep with the flail uh, for another non-lethal strike, but on the other cobalt, uh, the other uh, brain barnacle. To let the listener know, sweep is a trait that the flail has. What it says is when you attack with this weapon, you get a plus one bonus to your attack roll if you already attempted to attack a different target. So this attack is essentially going to be at a minus four instead of at a minus five for David. So let's give that a shot. And that is going to be a 21 to hit the other. Minus two for... Um, oh, right. Minus, minus two, two for, for non-lethal. For okay. Non-lethal. Right. That yeah. still hits. Okay. 19. You you hit it again. Amazing turn from nice. Mag. Why, yeah. Wildly effective. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is... This Beautiful. Has been, um, listen, guys. I'm, I'm pretty surprised, too. All right. Here is damage... For the second strike. Oh, that's also max damage. Second Woo! straight max damage roll. 11 points of damage. Oh, Mag, go. For the other brain barnacle. Wow. I love this game. <laughs> so Ma Mag charges up this hill and and with like ferocity, but also like delicate precision, bops and then bops again <laughs> these two helmets on these kobolds. It's what I'm seeing in my mind as I'm visualizing this uh, is like, did you did you did y'all ever have like the yo-yo craze where suddenly like a whole bunch of people got got really into yo-yo and were yo-yoing all the time? <laughs> yeah, like Matt totally. just executed like a little yo-yo move at the um 
at the I two like of that. these things. Yeah. Walking the dog out into Walking the yeah. dog. Yeah. And and on hitting the second one, she um lets out a cry, which so she's not raging. So that would probably sound something like um Ah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to give you a hero point for that turn. I think that was. It was too cool. It was too cool for me. Nice. Um, well, uh, enjoy it while it lasts because you're about to get attacked uh, a billion times. Whee! <laughs> we so so the kobold starts just frantically uh, swinging its spear out at Mag, trying to hit her in the knee repeatedly. So um, spear strike one uh, towards Mag's knee, terrible roll, an eight on the die. Spear strike two, another quick slash, a good roll for me, but it's a fourteen on the die. Another quick spear strike, that's a five. So so three wild swings towards Mag. Then this tentacle whips around and tries to wrap itself around Mag's neck. Mm. Oh. No! 18 to hit. And because Mag is not raging, that 18 does not hit. The rage would have lowered oh. my AC. Oh. We'll check this out. The second tentacle strike as another one wraps around to try to pull you towards it is a 19 to hit. Yeah, and that also doesn't hit only because of rage. My AC is staying at 20. And then a tentacle just flies up in the air and lands on the top. of It doesn't do anything. It's a four to hit. <laughs> it's an octopus's so garden out here. It sure that. is. That just gets Mag's hair a little wet, which she finds like really vexing. Has anyone ever actually been like properly stung by a jelly by a jellyfish? Like where like their tentacles actually like gone around your ankle? Yeah. Uh, I've only had a like in water zap. Never a like can't get it off. Yeah, I've never had it, that. Experience. It happened to my mom, and it was like it took two years. Like she was having reactions to it for two years. Oh my Gosh. god! Really? Ugh. Yeah. It was like a dying Portuguese man of war that was coming ashore. Oh my god! Oh, Hell of a way to go out, though. Yeah, fully you know? wrapped around her ankle. So that's making me think of that. Thanks, Lars. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that's kind of what the situation is. This is kind of like a Portuguese man of war that takes over your brain and then convinces <laughs> your friends to try to kill you. There you go. So um, here we are at the top of round two, and here's the situation as it stands now. At the bottom of this hill are Trill, Norman, and Philrook. Uh, Philrook looking pretty afraid. Midway up the hill, Vadim has has run up to to launch an attack. But at the very top of the hill, there's Mag, flanked by an unconscious and dying kobold and an unconscious but stabilized brain barnacle. It's Trill's turn. Trill, you see one of these kobolds dying, and you see Mag facing off with one of these creatures. What are you going to do? Trill's movement is 25 feet. So Trill's going to move 25 feet. And I think if I move 25 feet, that gets me within 30 feet of the kobold that's at dying too, right? Doesn't it get me just within 30 feet? Uh, yeah, it gets you just there, yes. Troll looks around and she goes, okay, guys, I think, I think you guys got this under control. I'm going to, I'm going to help this poor guy here. So Troll's going to cast Soothe on this dying kobold, assuming that he's a willing target. Safe assumption. Yeah. <laughs> Let me die! <laughs> I signed the DNR! <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, that worked out. So max healing. So Trill does uh, 14 points of healing to the dying kobold. And you see this huge breath fill the dying kobold's uh, body, and they uh, open their eyes and start, uh, j like, look panicked, looking around, going, meh, 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 oh, no! And Trill kind of tries to communicate as quickly as she can. We're, we're here to help you. And the kobold sees Norman standing a short distance behind Trill and just yells, ah, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> In like this really pathetic sort of way. Oh. Um, <laughs> <that's>... <laughs> it's cool, friend. We'll still have our picnic. Uh, and he looks like mega uh, hungover. He extends his like scaly clawed hand to uh, to his head and, and just like lies there on the ground looking very unhappy. Uh, who among us hasn't forgotten who we are for a brief moment, you know? <laughs> and, and as Norman shouts that out, it is Norman's turn. 
Um, so he's like starting to put the pieces together, still much slower than anyone uh, might like. But, you know, he sees the the kobold who's who's had the helmet knocked off, recognize him. He's hearing the word friend, which uh, is self-affirming for him. So he pulls out chompers and decides that he's going to try and uh, strike the, the helmet off of the other kobold's head. Uh, that was almost a good roll, but then it turns out that it wasn't. That was a 12. That 12 misses as Norman's arrow hits the ground a short distance away from this kobold. Um, and uh, Norman decides to fire uh, one more shot at the helmet to see if he can hit it off. 15. That's just barely another miss. So two quick thwip thwip as these arrows lodge themselves into the ground on either side of this kobold with the incutilis on its head. And as the second of those arrows hits the ground, Vadim sees that it is his time. What will Vadim do? Uh, well, Vadim, emboldened by the arrows at this incutilis, he's going to stride. Can he go here to flank with Mag, or is that rocky terrain and not sort of uh, inhabitable? So the area that Armat is pointing to is like just right at the wall of this valley that's that, that that you guys are inside of. I'll say that you can get into that square, but it's going to be difficult terrain. It's going to cost you 10 feet of movement to get into it. Maybe he has like one of his legs up on the side of the, the you know, ridge line or something like trying to angle himself to like really be able to fit in and flank. Uh, and then he is going to just spring into a double slice with Vigilance and his dagger. Uh, that is a 20 and a 15. So the 20 will hit, but the 15 misses. So one of these slices connects. And that is 16 damage. And that is more than enough as you slice clearly through this incutilis, and it is disgusting. It is just ocean slime spraying everywhere. Calamari everywhere. Calamari everywhere. <laughs> it's uh, it's like an aspic waterfall coming out of this. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> coming out of this incutilis. I love that aspic, even though it's meant to be food, is genuinely the most disgusting substance on earth. Oh, man. Yeah. I love a good 1970s cookbook. And as that happens, this uh, kobold falls to the ground and is now dying too. Where, where do they put the fucking dying condition on this thing? <laughs> oh, I just made Vadim dying. Great. <laughs> oh, God! <laughs> it smells so bad! <laughs> so, it is now the turn of Philrick. <laughs> Philrick says, I told you it was kobolds! And does nothing on his turn. <laughs> Thanks, Phil Rick. Mag sees this kobold dying at her feet. What is she going to do? Trill's turn is next. Trill still has spell slots. All right, Mag's and we just will be gonna, heading back to town soon. Yeah, Mag is just going um, to... Mag will delay. So she sees that the only thing that's left here is to heal this fellow, and, and she doesn't have the skill to do that in a timely or sort of emergency kind of way. So she, she drops to one knee and like tries to clear a little space and a little air around um, the victim, but otherwise just uh, just waits. It is now Trill's turn. Trill then casts Soothe once again. He uses another spell slot, knowing that they're heading back to town soon to heal this second kobold. And she heals this guy for only seven points, but you know, it's seven points. It's better than nothing. It's better than nothing. It's nearly as many as the eight hit points that he has. <laughs> oh, wow. So, and there's another <coughs> moment of this kobold opening her eyes, seeing her companion, her the other kobold uh, conscious on the ground nearby, and she just says, oh, "What? What the hell happened? Were you guys hanging out by the docks or something? Because you had these." terrible things that I've really only seen sailors have take over their brains. You had these like 
creepy and she kind of points to the shells that are dead and kind of destroyed on the ground next to her next to them you you had those things what are they called again they're uh incutilises you had incute in and incutil I don't know what the exact Latin is for them but you, you had you had brain barnacles your friend Norman over here he knew there was something wrong with you Norman get over here they look completely exhausted by everything that you have just told them. Like, this is so much information for for these kobolds. Like, they are groggy. They're, like, their eyes, their pupils are, like, different shapes and stuff. They're, like, waving back and forth uh, in the air as they're sitting on the ground. And Norman is, like, ten feet behind Trilly, sort of come forward, and he's just been um, acquiring a pile of kindling, and a, with a flint stone, he started a campfire for the picnic, and he's like, what? Oh, are we not going to roast those things? <laughs> no? Any Anyone hungry? I thought, are we not doing a picnic? Vadim is like poking <laughs> at one of them oh, with gosh. his, with vigilance and with like a very, very dubious expression on his face being like, oh, and I thought the undead were gross. What's, uh, what's Philrook doing? Philrook has rushed up between you as these kobolds are, are looking dazed and as Norman starts potentially setting up a uh, campfire to roast these mind control shrimp. <laughs> Philrook looks super excited. He says, well, I told you I would do it. Look, it's my mushroom picking bag. And he, uh, he whole, he reaches down and picks up this mushroom bag that's in the middle of this like war zone that has just jumped out uh, on this hill and he is so excited to have this bag back in his possession and he holds it up and he says I'm Phil Rook's a man of his word isn't he uh, 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 you should you should keep this it's a great bag Um, first question can I have some of the are there still mushrooms in it Oh, no, well, they got me right at the beginning of the day. I I was hoping to, to set up and, and catch the early mushrooms, and uh, it seems as though they they saw me. They they figured out what was... Uh, they, they, they were waiting for me uh, somehow. I, I don't know. I guess these kobolds are smart. What are those hats they're wearing? Oh, I don't... Listen, I'm getting ahead of myself. I... I'd cleaned the bag out uh, fully the, the after my previous day of uh, gathering, so it was a full... Uh, no, it's empty is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was going to say we could have uh, shish kebabs, but uh, I hear you. Uh, friends, friends! And he, he motions to the two kobolds, sort of drawing them near the fire so that they can you know hear tell of, of what's happened. How came you to have these delicious snacks on your heads? And the two kobolds are like rubbing the backs of their of their heads, which have like sort of circular puncture marks on them. And oh. they move in sort of instinctively in a coordinated way to stand in front of of Norman. And they, they like click their heels together and look up in Norman's face and they say, um, well, we were fishing. Uh, Kutsun here had managed to hook a fabulous fish. It was coming in, it was on the line and we, we would have eaten well for a week, but then, uh, and, and the other kobold continues, well, yes, uh, then, uh, I, I slipped and I would have lost the line had I not moved closer to water, so we stepped in, and the two of us were holding onto our fishing rod. Yes, we were holding onto the fishing rod, getting drawn closer and closer into the water, and then, as soon as we got to the edge, these two things, squishy, strange things, popped out of the water, latched onto both of our heads, and then um, started sucking on them, uh... And uh, Kutsun says, the, 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 the male uh, kobold says, Oh, maybe this is our fault. Hmm. Well, after the... After these squishy things started sucking on our heads, 
Uh, I started thinking about, uh, my friend who left food for us in the wreckage of the place that we bombed. And then I started thinking about how my friend was going to the lighthouse and exploring it. And then I started thinking about how everybody was counting on you to be a hero. And then I started thinking about how there was probably lots of treasure in the places you were exploring. And then I started thinking about, maybe this wasn't my thought. Maybe this is the <laughs> thought of the thing controlling me. But how uh, how helpful it would be if they took over your body and uh, used your body to uh, become powerful. Hey, guys, one correction there. Huh. Not your friend. Me, Norman. It's me. I'm the one who's been who's been bringing you snacks. It's not just some friend. And the other one uh, looks at you and says, "Oh, well." That is very kind of you. Uh, thank you. I, I should introduce myself. I am Damson Cork. Damson Cork, and nice to meet you. I'm I'm Norman. And he sets out a high five. You feel these sharp talons run over your hands for a moment as they hit you with this high five. High three, maybe. I feel like maybe they have little lizard hands. Yeah, they've got um. They've got Simpsons universe hands. It's a high. Th it's a high three. It's just three, three digits and a thumb, three yeah. D's and a T. That's what they say about kobolds. They do, yeah. Hmm. Um, so that's a high four, I guess. Uh, it's open to interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like in the in the briefest again, you'd have to have been looking really closely for the flash second, but like on feeling little claws scrape down his own palm, like you, you would see the very tips of claws start to come out of Norman's fingers, and then re like just sort of as like an animalistic response to like Aww. feeling a claw, but it you know it comes and goes really quick. A and you are? I, I don't know that we've met. And Norman turns to the other kobold. I'm I'm Kutzon. Uh, and DM some corp interrupts and says, I, I just want you to know that um, those things that Kutzen says he was thinking, I was thinking them too. It's not just Kutzen's fault. Uh, we were both having a situation happen vis-a-vis uh, -vis our minds, it sounds like. Yeah, who among <laughs> us hasn't, uh, you know, put on a funny hat and thought we could take over the world? And Norman winks at him and reaches in his back pocket and pulls out a, uh, like a much too big cowboy hat. He's like, Come on, Podnas. Oh, no, no, no. I've sworn off of hats. No more hats for me. Please, please. I, I, I cannot accept this. You'd look nice in a fedora. I'm just saying. You sure you don't want to try one? DMs and Cork reaches up her claw and pulls the cowboy hat onto her head. It's enormous. Yes. They uh, instantly suffocate and die. Oh, <laughs> You're right. That's it. Dang. Um, how did you all come to to be in town? I mean, I mean, you know, we've been friends, but how'd you get there in the first place? Ah, well, that's an interesting question. Well, I I don't know if you've heard the story of the thirsty alpaca. It was this place where the people in town would would spend their time and spend their money, and the stone scales are our group decided to torch it and to bomb it. And and Kutzen and I, we said, no, we won't do that. The, there's no use in, in, in doing something like that. So the leadership of our, of our group uh, saw fit to make us the two meant to deliver the bombs uh, to die in the explosion. And Kutzen says, or at the very least to be caught by the human townsfolk and, and killed. But we were too sneaky for that. We've been living within the wreckage, surviving off of fish ever since. And we don't want to go back. And Kutzen continues, and we'll, we're never going to get caught. So we're living our dream of spending time in burnt out wreckage of a once popular bar and fishing constantly. It's a beautiful life. That's your dream? Well, you know, once you get exiled from your family and um, everybody tells you that you're terrible and then they send you to die, you're the what you call a dream sort of gets redefined uh, dynamically. <laughs> yeah, I can understand that. Okay, sure. Yep. It's a sliding scale. 
<laughs> exactly. Uh, she, the, the enormous one gets it. That's what... Uh, almost no one ever says that, really. <laughs> well, you know, things are not so bad in town. I mean, we all know people. We could... Do you all do you all want to go back there and and you know find a a new community you could be a part of? What what do you mean? What what sort of new community? Well, I, I don't know. There's that thirsty alpaca building. It's kind of decrepit. It feels like it's probably going to become a tort liability at some point. You could you could go back there and and make it a home or a, a store. I don't know. What do you guys like doing? See, I told you it would be a tort liability. I keep telling DMs in court, this is a clear tort liability and waiting to happen. You've ah. got to be careful. We'll get you insurance. Rin knows how to get insurance. Rin can do anything. Right. So what are you suggesting? Well, I, I, what do you guys like doing, aside from having your brains taken over by mollusks? Is there a basement at the Thirsty Alpaca? Uh, there is. It's been largely collapsed, but that's, been, that's where we have spent much of our time. Yes. Sure. What 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 would you what would you do there if you could do anything? Let's slide the scale on that dream way up high to a rainbow. Am I right, friend? So as we scale the dream to a rainbow, I'm gonna say these two kobolds that are living in the wreckage of the thirsty alpaca, you don't need to you don't need to come up with it now, but if you want to, like I will count on you guys to tell me what it is that you want them to do. There are a lot of items and shopping things that are not available in Otari. The way that Otari is described in the rules of this game, you can't get anything bigger than level four at the shops in Otari with the exception of consumable items. So I'm going to say that these two don't have any particular ideas of what it is that they could do, but you could think it over and then enlist them to get some particular kind of thing to make it available to the to the group when they're in town um what hmm. well that's yeah it's an interesting invitation i i feel like armat maybe has an idea yeah what you got well one thing that may become useful at some point is rune stones since we've got a couple different uh martial classes um and if we're limited to level four stuff, I mean, this might not come up till a little further down the road, but that might be something. And like we think about, uh, cause, uh, otherwise I think we're going to have to go to Absalom, which is kind of the nearest big city. Matt, is that the same kind of stones as the ones that you put in a wayfinder to have the wayfinder, the way, the way the wayfinder works, there's some sort of stone you can mount in it. And it, I, those, yeah, those are Aeon stones. Oh, okay. um, that is another kind of item, but you could potentially, that's oh. also on the table if you wanted to do that. Hmm. Yeah, that could be cool too. I don't know much about those. Nor um, I, I just remember reading that in the Wayfinder description, but I have no idea what they are or what they do. But I don't think that we need to make a, a choice right now. Like the kobolds say, well, um, if you think of something you would like us to do, uh, it would potentially be more exciting than just living underground and trying not to get killed by the, the people in town. Yeah, I mean, we're happy to help out. Let's we'll put on our thinking caps and come back to you guys. No, 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 no. Don't put on any oh. sort of thinking cap. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, <laughs> me metaphoric, <laughs> figurative thinking caps. No actual... No nothing will actually go on our heads that was at any point living. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> no, we probably just see Vadim sort of do a like <laughs> shiver and shudder and yeah. I uh, I misspoke. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, let's <laughs> let's head back to town. We'll get you guys set up in the basement. Uh, you can get the rubble cleaned up, and we'll we'll figure out what's next. We might have some inspiration over a drink. And yeah. and Phil Rook uh, is still holding this bag and says, "Does anybody want my mushroom picking bag?" Bag. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, th thanks, bud. It's been fun. I feel like we've learned so much from each other. We, we really got uh, a lot out of this interaction, Phil Rook. <laughs> if you see a werewolf around, give us a call. And as Norman grabs this bag from Phil Rook, 
he gets the impression that this is no normal bag. This seems to have some sort of magic or something coursing through it. Guys, I've I've made this bag magical. And Norman decides what he's done to the bag to make it special. <laughs> Wait, Norman, what, what are you talking about? And Trill grabs the bag. And Trill senses aura. Yes. So so you sense you sense magic on on this bag. The 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 school of magic that you sense on it is, of course, we all know we're all so familiar with the schools of magic here. It's in, it's it's insulting for me to say it's, it's conjuration. Abjur- con- conjuration. It's, con- it's conjuration, conjuration magic. Nature. Um, Nature magic. And if you oh, if con- you would yeah. like. Right. <laughs> if you'd like to uh, spend 10 minutes identifying it as you walk back to town. Uh, Philip Rick says, well, uh, I'll just go back to that hole that I live in. And he wanders off um, to the it's north hoot, somewhere. It's been a hoot, bud. It's been a hoot. Hoot, and, hoot and to you. Yeah, yeah. Get, watch, watch out for that guy hoot in the woods. Hoot, hoot. I don't believe hoot is canon. <laughs> <laughs> he is now. But Trill uh, is able to, uh, to, to make a check as you're walking and catching up more with these kobolds to see what this object is. Can you give me one of those checks that I just threw in the in the chat, please? Yes, I can. Oh, great. I can do an occultism check. Fantastic. And this feels like an oddity identification. Okay. Does it feel like oddity? What, what is oddity so identification? Oddity identification, remember, was a feat that I took. I know you took it. I just don't know what it does. But literally, it's with identifying oddities. For mental possession, prediction, or scrying traits. And this is something that I, is a possession trait, right? It's no, something it's a, that I'm it's, pos- a, it's a mushroom so I'm possessing. It's bag. a bag. It's a bag. It's an oddity. Yeah, no, it doesn't. It's not relevant to this check. Sorry. This is not oddity identification. Boo. No. I think I'd, you'd think when I have an actual odd item that I'm identifying, I'd get to use oddity identification. It's a skill feat. You're going to be lucky if it works once. (laughs) Okay, so Trill gets a really good look at this mushroom picking bag as you're returning to town. And she identifies this as a bag of holding. Woo! No! This is a bag that that weighs one bulk to carry and can hold 25 bulk inside of it without getting any heavier at all. Trill reaches into this bag and her arm just goes and goes and goes and goes. We could probably fit Trill inside I was inside about to say, Trill, just, yeah. I, Trill finally <laughs> opens it up and just smiling, jumps inside the bag. <laughs> Mag can now literally put Trill in her pouch. <laughs> A living creature placed inside the bag has enough air for 10 minutes before it begins to suffocate, (laughs) and it can attempt to escape with a DC of 13. Yeah, that's 10 minutes. (laughs) Yeah, Mag reaches in and and pulls pulls Trill out, and then puts her back in. My God. (laughs) And then pulls her back out. I'm just imagining Trill like a koala on uh, Mag's arm. Right, the fact that Troll could be put in there and then try to get out during a fight or something is fun. I guess any of us Ooh, could go in, Norman. right? Surprise! Norman could get yeah. stealthy in that thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you knock on a door and there's just a bag outside as like the orc opens the door and is like, well, Classic I guess I Trojan should bring this bag. inside. Yeah, all right. Yeah. And, and then Norman pops out and is like, hey, buddy. Guys, <laughs> this is so exciting for us to finally have this, especially finding like all those books and shit yes, in the library. Like, totally. this is so exciting to finally have this thing where we can just. Max's gonna to, like, have to start working out though. Oh yeah. my gosh, she's been. She's not gonna get her her usual aerobics in carrying <laughs> everything for us. That's yeah. right. Whatever the uh, whatever the the uh, Galarian equivalent of a Fitbit is, it's gonna be really unhappy <laughs> with with Mag's load being so so lightened. So we do have to be careful not to overload it. If the bag is overloaded or broken, it ruptures and is ruined. That'd be so sad. Causing the items inside to be lost forever. Oh, no. Yeah. Wow. So mechanically, like, how many actions does it take in in uh, 
initiative to take stuff out of it? Is it this, the equivalent of taking it off your belt, or is it like harder to? I think don't don't hold me to this. I yeah. think it is the same as pulling something out of a backpack, meaning that you would have to spend an action to put it on the ground and then an action to draw the thing out, which is how taking stuff out of a backpack works. Got it. But like in theory, there could just be like giant. You we could just like have a chariot in there or whatever. Yeah, yeah, and there are bigger <laughs> and bigger bags of holding. Like the 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 highest level bag of holding is a level is a level thirteen item that can hold one hundred fifty bulk of stuff inside. Yeah, this is this is oh, a type so we, one, so we have twenty five bulk yes, with it. So you have twenty five. Awesome bulk. though. Get some this big great big weapons this. or of furniture or like some horses to ride around in. It's also whatever. exciting to me to get into this game because it is such an iconic like classic Dungeons and Dragons item. Hell yeah. It's an item that has both profound mechanical impact and also tons of potential for like flavor and thinking about it and like you can you can get as much out of this as you want to or as little out of it as you want to. It's We can get so many fucking nice. snooks in that bag. Yeah. We're never going to be hungry again. That's right. This and is now a very good mushroom. I feel bad bag. for making for giving Philrick a hard time about like just getting a bag off of him. This is a great bag. He's an idiot. Don't worry about him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And how many bags of holding are there with an emblem of a, a delicious lion's mane mushroom on <laughs> The guy loves lion's mane's mushrooms. I mean, I love mushrooms. I love lion's mane's mushrooms. I, I hate mushrooms. Oh, like, right. It's, a, I'd it's forgotten. a thing that, that it's like one of my primary character traits is that lion's mane are unlike any other mushroom. I'm They're looking at so this picture meaty. that David just sent. It's disgusting I'm looking. Sorry, to me. I forgot that your revulsion for mushrooms is runs so so deep, or I just absolutely wouldn't have sent it. It looks really weird. You slice into it, and it is incredibly meaty. Like it, it the texture is unlike any other mushroom. I want to like cook it for you at some point because you're not uh, gonna write. You cook it like what you want to do is cook it for yourself. Robin. Yeah, you cook it like <laughs> fried chicken. You're you're un you, you fry Robin. it up like fried chicken. Robin. You would not no, no, know no, no. it's a mushroom. Robin. The, 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 you, what Robin. you think, Lar? The level of dislike for mushrooms Lars is expressing is three orders of magnitude higher than what than what you think it is. <laughs> this is like this is like serious aversion territory. I, I loathe them. I Ugh. hate them more than I hate just about anything. You know when Chris and I got engaged. About five minutes after we got engaged, the first the first thing I did then was immediately forage mushrooms from the woods with my brand new engagement ring on my hand. I'm happy for you. I love mushrooms so but much. But this this nightmare <laughs> mushroom that David just sent a picture of, the idea that you're going to cut it open and it's going to be like fried chicken is absurd. <laughs> We had a wedding guest years ago who, uh, upon attending our wedding, uh, we had, you know, a dietary needs and preferences section of the RSVP, wrote uh, that he had an aversion to squash so strong it bordered on an allergy. And I feel like that's what you have for mushrooms. <laughs> yeah, I used to when I was younger and, and hopefully more annoying than I am now. I used to say that kind of thing. I don't I haven't said that sort of thing for years, but we were all much younger then, you know. <laughs> yeah, I am. Um, I don't like them. So Fair. you finish your, your walk <laughs> to back to town. This hole that you just came up out of this tunnel that was connected into this warren that then connected into this natural tunnel that brought you to the ruins of Gauntlet came out of the ground about halfway into the forest surrounding Otari. So it's a it's a faster walk from here back to town. You know, it's not that late in the day right now, um, but you guys are worn out and depleted. So the question that I have is, what do you want to do now? Well, Chill needs a night rest. Yeah. And then after a night's rest, she's ready to go back to the dungeon. She doesn't need to do any, she doesn't need to spend a week in town again. I think Mag will be feeling anxious and itchy to get back to dungeon and get back into the mystery the like the week away from town was already in town was already a lot for her and i think she will also be feeling that she's caused this delay like she doesn't want there to be delays and she's caused this one by sort of charging in and getting ambushed and costing the party all of the spells and everything else so i think she'd be ready for like all right we gotta sleep like 
an early night's sleep and an early start and like get back to the dungeon. I think that's what she'd be advocating for. Yeah, I think Vadim is also thinking so much about the Nimbloth door and like what's behind it and sort of just focused on, you know, sharpening vigilance, cleaning his boots, getting everything sort of ready and prepped, uh, making sure that when the tomorrow morning rolls around, he's ready to get up and go right away. Okay. You set off in the morning, early, around nine o'clock. And you make your way down into the third basement level of Gauntlet, into the library area, the smell of dust and rotting flesh greeting you once more. You find Augriel sitting on the same couch that you saw him sitting on before, and he looks at you and says, Oh, I'm glad it didn't take you so long to get back this time. Uh, I've been doing a lot of thinking. I'm not sure if I should come with you today. And if you want to, you can make a diplomacy or an intimidation check to convince him to come. Oh, come on, bud. We, we gotta get through that door. You, you wanna see this through? Let's do it. Let's see this. Let's see this to its end. You you owe it to yourself. And Lars, uh, I wanna I wanna argue that because he has come with us twice already, this should be an easier check and a lower DC and I think that's you know. totally reasonable. I will lower the DC a little bit because of the connection that you've made with him already. I think that that totally makes sense. It's a 29. He's got a frown boost. It's a 30. Ew. Okay, so that's a critical success with that lower DC. And he says, You're right. I'm gonna see this through with you until it is done. And yeah, you will Augie. now have Augriel following you for the next week, no matter what. He will come with you. The next week? All right. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> So you you push your way forward through the north hallway and you see that room with the green light one more time. Mag, hold it. Just hold it. So this is the green light that Mag has followed twice. Upon seeing the green light in the hallway coming from the same sort of closet room as before, Mag draws a sharp breath in, sprints forward 10 feet, and then stops abruptly and turns around to the party and says... Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys are heading towards this door with the vision of Nimbaloth on it, right? With the image of Nimbaloth on it. Okay. Yeah. So you're you're able to methodically pick your way down the hallways, retracing Augriel's path through this floor after he was attacked by these ghouls. And you find yourselves a few moments later in this large restricted library chamber and it still has the tattooing equipment of the of this strange ghoul that you faced off with last time you were here set up in the room it appears that nobody else has touched this room since you uh, fought him and everything is quiet as you step towards this large double door with this image of this feminine figure reaching towards spirits rising from the grave and eating them. I want to ask you a question. What do you guys think is behind this door? There's that thing called the canker, right? Canker. That the ghouls have been worshipping. I suspect that's some sort of either avatar or servant of Nimbaloth. And I think once we open these doors, we're going to come face to face with it. I don't know what it's going to look like, though. Maybe it's a librarian. You know, there hasn't been anyone to check the books out from. <laughs> I hope. Yeah, that would make sense. It's just yeah. it's just responsible stewardship. If you're going to have a library, <laughs> you need to have someone in charge. 
Yeah. Canker is undercommon for librarian. Yeah. <laughs> nang nang bonobo. It's, yeah, it's it's nang nang. Oh right, bonobo. I guess it would be acclo. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway. <laughs> Canker is all that comes to mind for me. Yeah, like I, I don't know. This is super weird, but like Belcora, like this is her office. She, we also think she might be an avatar of Nimbleoth. Oh, could it be the book lady who is the librarian? The book lady oh, that, um, Azrenae's lover. Azrenae was in. Oh, yes. right. oh I forgot yes. about her. Take that. Yeah. Well, we'll find out what's on the other side of this door when uh. we pick up from here next time. Ooh, a mystery. E, all of the above. <laughs> The Roots of Ruin is a tabletop gold production produced under the Paizo Incorporated Community Use Policy. The Roots of Ruin uses trademarks and or copyrights owned by Paizo Inc. used under Paizo's Community Use Policy. We are expressly prohibited from charging you to use or access this content. Paizo does not recognize, endorse, or sponsor this project in any way. Original characters and content are the property of tabletop gold. For more information about Paizo Inc. and Paizo products, visit paizo.com. We at Tabletop Gold would love to hear from you. Email us at letters at tabletopgold.com and find all our social links at tabletopgold.com. <laughs>